Hello, I'm Phil Langton, and I've been a teacher at Hampton for over 20 years. Welcome to Discover Hampton, a podcast that takes you through the school gates and into the classrooms, meeting teachers and pupils, and getting an insight into what today's young people are loving to learn and why. In this, our first series, we're unlocking the wonder of languages, maths, science and English, history and music. Today on Discover Hampton, we hear how, with a little guidance, young minds can unlock the magic of maths. Hello, my name is Daniel Griller. I've been teaching maths at Hampton School for 11 years. I suppose I teach maths because I enjoy it, and it's not so easy to say exactly why I enjoy it. What I know for certain is that I get a buzz out of it. I've enjoyed maths for as long as I can remember. It was my favourite and best subject at school. I studied the subject at university. And I considered working in the city. I had a summer internship at a major investment bank and I absolutely hated it. And it's only at that point that I discovered that there were certain schools that encouraged recent graduates to get a taste for what it was like teaching. I picked Hampton and I've been here ever since. Today you'll be hearing variations on a theme. I found a problem from a maths competition in the Netherlands. It's a counting problem. The technical term for this class of problem is combinatorics. It's just a very fancy way of saying something like how to count with style or how to count without actually needing to do all the hard work that you would expect from counting. Problems that, given enough time and care, could be solved with brute force, possibly with the help of a computer, but which are far more interesting without the computer, using clever strategies that can be found to shortcut the work. We're going to start with the first years. First years, I'm going to give you a small version of the problem that I'm giving the lower sixth, and then I'm going to give you the original problem, the big problem. Consider two coins. I say coins, but they don't have heads or tails on them. You can't tell the faces of the coins apart. In how many different ways can you write the numbers one, two, three, and four on the two coins with one number on each face? I don't care about the order of the coins, and because we can't tell the faces of the coins apart, it doesn't matter which side which number is written on. In how many different ways can I pair up the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, so that there are two numbers on each coin? Well, at Hampton, it's very interactive. Even if you know a lot of stuff about math or you've learned it, there's still something new that you learn every single time. Well, he's quite a fun teacher, so like, he makes the lessons very enjoyable and he explains things very well. Can anyone give me one way of pairing? Yes. Just a single way of pairing the numbers up. Like yeah. One, two, three, four. Yeah, you can have a one, two coin and you can have a three, four coin. So that's, that's one way of pairing them up. Does anyone think there, there's a different way of pairing the numbers up? Yeah. Uh, one, three, two, four. Yeah, you can pair one with three and then two gets paired with four. Are those two pairings the only possible pairings? Oh, now you've got another uh, pairing. There's one, four, and two, three. Yeah, you can pair one with four and two with three. Yep. What do you think? I think there's three possibilities, yeah. Three possibilities? That's what I think. Well, we've already listed three possibilities, so you're saying there aren't any more. Yeah. Okay. If now you have five coins, and you have the numbers one to ten to put on the faces of the coins, in how many different ways can we pair up the numbers one to ten? I want to own a company, a small business, or something probably linked to maths because it's 100% my favourite subject. Maybe even um, help other people learn maths because the Hampton teachers definitely provided me with a good experience. I want to share it with other people. I'm Jay and I'm in first year. I like when we have class discussions because like everyone has an input and it's like a almost like a debate. I quite enjoy like hearing everyone's ideas in like a chat kind of thing. What was your strategy? Um, what we did basically was um, we, we made it so that thinking of the possibilities where there's one, two, three, four and five coins. It sounds like an absolutely brilliant idea. If you're presented, it's just a fantastic general strategy. If you have a problem that seems too difficult at the outset because the, the numbers involved are too big, just Look at a much simpler problem first and so, build up gradually. 
for one coin, we know there are, there's one possibility. Yep. For two coins, we figured out there's three. Yep. For three coins, let's say the first coin can be one, two, one, three, one, four, one, five, one, six. Yep. That's five possibilities. Uh, for every first coin, there are three possibilities because there are two coins left, and we know that if there are two coins, there are three possibilities. Yeah, that's good. So we do uh, three times uh, five, 15. And if we do that for the fourth one, there's four times two minus one, seven. Seven times a hundred. No, seven times 15 is 105. And then uh, two times five minus one, nine. 105 times nine is 945. Yeah. So this. I guess this has had, this is is having the result that I want. Building up from smaller cases to the to the big problem is a fantastic problem solving strategy in general. For one coin, there's only one way of pairing up the numbers one and two. We already discussed what happens with two coins. There are three options. And if you have three coins, if you consider, for example, what gets paired up with the one, you have five choices: two, three, four, five, or six. But then whichever of those five choices you make for the one, what you have left is two coins and four numbers to pair up. And because we already looked at the two coin case, we know that there are only three ways to pair up the remaining four numbers. So the total for three coins is five times three. And similarly, the total for four coins would be seven times whatever it was for three coins. Seven times five times three. And then it's only a small step to the answer to the big problem. If you have five coins, you have nine choices for what goes with the one. And for each of those nine choices, you now have eight numbers to put on four coins, which can be done in seven times five times three times one ways. So the answer is just the product of all the odd numbers from one to nine. Nine times seven times five times three times one, which is 945. It's getting quite late, so I think that's probably a natural place to stop. Okay, let's leave the first years and welcome in the lower sick. I'm here with the lower sixth. Good morning. I'm going to give you a, a very similar set of problems to the first years. And it'll be interesting to see whether you find them of equal difficulty, what the different approaches are. So I'll give you one warm up and then I think I'll just go straight after that into the big problem. Suppose you have five silver coins and I say coins, but they don't have heads or tails. You can't tell either face of the coins apart. The task is to put the numbers 1 to 10 on the coins, on the 10 faces of the coins, with one number on each face. And I suppose it's the most natural question you could possibly ask about such a pairing. How many pairings are there? In how many ways can I number these five coins with the numbers 1 to 10, one on each face? I don't care about the order of the coins. There's no sense in which having a one on this face is the same as having a one on the other face of the same coin. I can't tell the faces apart. So as a starter, in how many ways can I number these five coins with the numbers 1 to 10? One number on each face. OK, so, mm. so order. We can start by 10. Like, sure you can do that. This, well, what you can do is it's so it's just about, hi, I'm Rohan, and I'm in lower six. My plans for after Hampton is I'm hoping to study maths at uni and continue learning about maths. I like the applied side of maths, so I'm hoping to do a statistics course at uni. And I think, especially with stuff like the pandemic, we've seen how useful you know, stuff like statistics can be for the public. My name is Danny, I'm in lower six. Maths will play a huge role in the future. Our world is already extremely digital, whether that be you know, algorithms on Twitter or the intense mathematical modeling going into deciding the Bank of England's bank rate. And this is only going to increase. Maths is a, it's a weapon, it's power, and especially in the longer term. As we, what have we seen with the artificial intelligence, for example? Our world is increasingly becoming, in fact, reliant on, on maths and the models that it brings. And so, I think it has a huge, huge, huge role in the future. And that is why my friends and I, we're, we're so into maths because it is, it, it is immense. Yeah.
I'm currently focused on university where I intend to study economics. I'm open to anything, whether that be going into the corporate environment, financial consultancy, going to policy, or maybe staying in the academic world. I'll, I'll let my, my interests and my desire to, to improve the world drive my future decisions. It, well, it sounds like both groups have got some idea as to how to solve this. Do you, so do you think, Henry, you've got the solution? Okay, so we considered that there are 10 coins. So, well, the first face of the first coin can have 10 possible numbers, and then the other face can have 9, 8, and then the next coin, the first face can have 8, 7, 6, 5. So that's 10 factorial, different ways of putting the numbers. But, but then you have to exclude some cases because the order doesn't matter. Because there's five coins, there's five factorial, different orderings. So if you divide by five factorial, but then the orientation of each coin, it doesn't matter which number is on the top and which number is on the bottom of the coin. So that's divide by two for each coin. So divide by two to the power of five. I got 945. 945. 945 is one times three times five times seven times nine. And that is the answer I had as well. I think now I will give you the, the problem, the original problem from the Netherlands. And I'm well aware of the fact that given enough time and enough care, it would be possible to do this with brute force manually or possibly with the help of a computer. So today I'm more interested in can you come up with a clever counting method that saves you having to check lots and lots of different cases and also um, removes the risk of a mistake from, for example, repeating the same thing or just having to miss one out. So this is the problem. Again, it involves putting numbers 1 to 10 on five different coins. It's another counting question. This time, there is one condition that has to be satisfied. So there were 945 ways to pair up the numbers 1 to 10 on these five coins. How many of those 945 ways satisfy the following, that on each coin, one number is at least twice the other. And on the face of it, I think it sounds like a very difficult problem, but either through your own discussions or me giving you a little bit of a push at various points, hopefully you'll come to realize that it's simpler than it seems at first. Okay. I guess we could start by considering Intriguing. just one's going to have to be on one of the coins. So <laughs> Why don't we start from the opposite? One. We can start, right, with, start, so with, one. We start with one. We start with one. We start with one. I think. Well. Oh, so yeah. You can seven, pair that with anything yeah. from so one to five. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Six, seven, ten. eight, nine, and ten. No, 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 Hello, ten. I'm Henry, and I'm in the lower sixth. After Hampton, I am planning to study maths at university, and well, it's always been my favourite subject at school. So I'm following my, my passion for maths and see where that leads me after university. Um, my name is Ishan. Uh, I'm in lower sixth. After Hampton, I hope to continue studying maths at, um, at university. I would obviously like to pursue my passion for maths as well as my passion for money further in the field of finance, um, in which in which maths is uh, extremely useful. Yeah. Times two. So that's three factorial, which is six. And then one, we just take Hi, uh, I'm Thomas. So the thing I like most about studying at Hampton. It's probably the opportunity, you know, to challenge yourself. If you ever finish your work or, you know, you want to seek any topic further, there's always teachers willing to help. Whether you want to do an extended project or Olympiads in maths, things I've taken part in the past. And, you know, it's really interesting. And you never feel like, you know, there's not another step you can take because there always is. So um, I want to study economics at uni, which becomes increasingly mathematical every year. I mean, my dad studied it four years, 30 years ago, and that was much less than now. And so, yeah, I really enjoy doing maths in these kind of, you know, scenarios where you can see the tangible results in the world, and economics is one of those. All the way to 2N, N has to go with 2N. I plan to study aeronautical engineering. I'm looking forward to using my math skills to design planes and rockets and help uh, solve the world's problems. It sounds like both of you have answers to this particular problem. Well, the way we thought about it is that if you consider the other end, so not 10, uh, not one, you consider 10, yep. well, 10 has to go with five. Because if it's anything 
the only way that five is paired with anything that is at least double it is with ten. Yep. And then for for four, you can either have eight or nine. For three, I'm, I I think I agree with you, but if your justification is only what you've told me, then I mm. think I have to ask more questions. So you say five has to go with ten. Yeah. Why can't five go with two or one? Because five oh, is more than oh. double two. Five is more than double one. I haven't considered that just yet. That's a very fair point. Uh, we, we have a justification over here. OK. Yes. Um, so if you consider six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, like their doubles are 12, 14, 16, 18, and 20. So these, these numbers cannot be on the coin. So six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 must all be the highest on their respective coins. Which means that five, because there's only five coins, we've already got the five highest numbers on each of the five coins. So five must be one of the lower numbers. Yeah. Um, Fairfall must go with 10. Yeah, I agree with that. Six, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. None of, you can't have any two of those on the same coin. If you double the smallest number, you're already bigger than the biggest number, 10. So that, yeah, that, that's a massive shortcut. You have to have six, seven, eight, nine, and ten all on separate coins. Yeah. Do you, do you think you have a solution that gets you the answer to the problem? Um, I think so. All right, well, carry sure on. So, uh, so so far we have that six, seven, eight, nine, ten each have to be written on separate coins. Yeah. And then? And then five, um, because double five is ten, and five is five is one of the smaller ones, so it must go with something at least double it. So yep. five must pair up with ten. Like likewise, double four is eight, so four must go with either eight or nine. Double three is six, so three can go with any of six, seven, eight, and nine. And same with two and one because they're smaller than three. So there's two. There's two possible coins the number four can be on. So that's two possibilities. And then um, the remaining three numbers can go in on any of the remaining three numbers. So that's three times two times one, which is six ways for that. So six, I think the answer is the two combinations four can be in, multiplied by the six combinations of three, two, and one in each of the two cases of four, which results in 12. I agree. So I guess the moment you hear the problem, it seems likely that there are lots and lots of ways of pairing up the numbers on the coin satisfying this condition. But depending on your point of view and your, your strategy, in fact, the strategy we've taken here, you have very little choice at every stage. Once you establish that 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 all have to be on separate coins, we have no freedom over that. If you then consider where the 5 can, can go, we have no choice over that either. It has to be paired up with the 10. So the first time we actually have any freedom at all is with where the four goes. The four can be paired up with the eight or the nine. Fine, we have two choices. And whichever of those two choices we make for the four, we then have three choices. We have no further restrictions. We have three choices for where the three goes, and then we'll have two choices for where the two goes, and then one choice for where the one goes. So in the end, the only calculation we have to make is two times three times two times one, which is 12 which is the answer to the problem. I think that seems like a very natural place to end. Thank you for coming to maths today. I hope you've enjoyed solving these problems. If it's the sort of thing you enjoy, I have a couple of recommendations. Online, there's a system called Alchemist. You can find it with a quick search on the Art of Problem Solving website. And I think it has a database of something like 13,000 problems from all over the world. The clever thing about the Alchemist system is it learns very quickly what your strengths and weaknesses are. That's my recommendation for an online resource. I also have some book recommendations as I've written a couple of puzzle collections myself. They can also be found with a very quick online search. The first book is called Elastic Numbers and the second is called A Ring of Cats and Dogs. And finally, I'll leave you with this. Did you know that there are 360 ways to arrange the letters in the word circle? Thank you again, and enjoy discovering Hampton. Thanks, Daniel. That was great. 
As any teacher will tell you, we live for those golden light bulb moments when everything clicks into place. And over this series, we'll be witnessing the skill, dedication and passion that great teachers bring to their lessons in Discover Hampton, a podcast from Hampton School. You can find out more at www.hamptonschool.org.uk. Remember to follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening and goodbye for now.